Hello, my name is Brian. I have an academic background in philosophy and psychology and cognitive science, and I've just written a book about love, including the neurochemistry of love. And so I've been asked to talk a little bit about what love is from a philosophical and cognitive science perspective. So uh, basically, the model that we talk about in our book, which is called Love Drugs, The Chemical Future of Relationships, is what you might characterize as a biopsychosocial model of love. And it just suggests that the psychological part of love, the experience of love that many people are familiar with, and which is the sort of thing that's normally written about in literature and art and pop songs and so forth, that's definitely part of what love is, is the subjective experience of love. Um, but there's also a biological underpinning to love, which has to do with various things going on in our brains, and for most of human history we didn't know much about that part. Although you do see some traditions talking about various love potions and so forth, which are meant to act on the body in some way, so there's some intuitive sense in uh, a lot of the literary traditions about love that it's some embodied thing as well as being a psychological phenomenon. And then the social aspect of love just refers to the fact that what counts as love in a given society or culture or historical period can sometimes change. Uh, for example, in homophobic historical Victorian England, for example, a lesbian couple might have all the biological and psychological aspects of love firing away in their subjective experience and, and neurochemically. But in that context, their love for each other might not be recognized as love. Uh, they might not be able to uh, bring up children together or express their affection in public or whatever it might be. Uh, I don't know why I'm picking Victorian England. There are, of course, many places around the world today where same-sex love doesn't count as love in the social context. And so you can see how that could feed back into the psychological experience of love. If you feel ashamed of your feelings in a public setting, that can obviously affect how you experience your love for your partner. Uh, that in turn can affect your neurochemistry. Uh, shame can inhibit the expression of sexual desire, which can cause you to not, uh, you know, uh, have certain kinds of behaviors um, that would normally lead to the release of oxytocin, which is one of the brain chemicals that um, influences romantic attachment. And so all these layers kind of feed into each other, and um, that's the main point about, about love to make. Um, on the biological side, there are a number of different theories, but basically the most common one suggests that there are these underlying brain systems that evolved to suit the reproductive needs of our ancestors. The libido or lust system, the evolutionary purpose of that is to draw us toward a range of uh, potential partners. It's mostly underwritten by testosterone and estrogen and, and other neurochemicals uh, you probably have heard of. Um, there's also the attraction system, and the point of that is to narrow our focus down to a smaller number of potential partners, maybe one in particular, and serotonin and norepinephrine and adrenaline and other kinds of brain chemicals are involved in the modulation of that system. And all of these chemicals can be manipulated. You can change testosterone levels, you can change serotonin levels. That's what uh, a lot of antidepressant drugs do, is they interact with the serotonin system. So um, I'll come back to that maybe in a second. And then the final system is the attraction, or sorry, the attachment system. And attachment is what keeps parents bonded to their children. It's, it's characteristically talked about in terms of the maternal infant bond because through breastfeeding and other intimate activities, oxytocin is released along with some other uh, brain chemicals like vasopressin and dopamine. And these things reinforce the attachment bond directly at the level of the brain and adult romantic partners also release oxytocin when they have sex with each other and orgasm and sensuous touching and so forth and so that's part of what's going on neurochemically when you form an attachment pair bond with somebody um, so how does all this brain chemistry relate to some higher level conception of love and how might various actions that we take like consuming drugs for medicinal or other purposes interact with our ne romantic neurochemistry and then potentially have implications for love at these higher levels uh, like psychology and in terms of the social meanings and the social context. An analogy I like to use is um, to think of the Mona Lisa. So the Mona Lisa exists as and can be described at a number of different levels. One of them is the physical level of the canvas and the paint that's on the canvas which could all be described in principle, in terms of two-dimensional bits of information about what exact color or shade of paint exists at which point in the two-dimensional uh, grid of the canvas, 
And once you've told me all that information, this, this low-level two-dimensional information, there's a sense in which you would have given me a complete, a technically complete description of the Mona Lisa. I would know all the stuff I need to know to, for example, reproduce the painting. Um, but most people would say that a really robust understanding of something as complicated as the Mona Lisa involves a lot of different layers of analysis, including subjective aspects, like what is it like to look at the Mona Lisa, and how might we feel or respond to the emotion that we see expressed in the peculiar smile of the subject, or whatever it might be. And then also the socio-historical context matters. It really matters who made this painting for how we respond to it and interpret it and understand its significance in, in the wider cultural uh, milieu. So um, knowing something about the, the socio-cultural and historical background is part of what it is to understand the Mona Lisa. So um, a similar thing, I think, is going on in the case of love. Um, there is a technically complete sense, at least in principle, in which you could describe the reality of love at, at the level of the brain in terms of neuroanatomy and brain chemicals and their actions and how they play out. We might not ever be in a position to actually describe all of those levels because there's an epistemological limitation there. It's actually hard to get down to a fine-grained level of detail, the explanation at that level. But we're getting better and better at it, and we have more and more of a sense of what's going on in people's brains when they fall in love and fall out of love and form attachments and so forth. Um, but I think a lot of people would say just reducing love to brain chemicals isn't going to give you a robust sense of what this phenomenon is, that you really can't understand what love is unless you also take into consideration the subjective psychological elements. What does it feel like to be in love? And also the so social and uh, historical uh, context, as I've talked about before. The upshot of all of this is that there's different ways to intervene in love and change love. So one way that people are familiar with from, from everyday life is maybe going to couples counseling. You can take active steps to intervene in the psychology, the subjective experience of love and the sort of thoughts and beliefs and meanings and so forth that are involved in your relationship. You can intervene in that level by you know, uh, going on a romantic vacation or um, going to talk therapy with your partner or whatever it might be. Uh, also, obviously, the social script for love can change over time. So I brought up the example of same-sex love not really counting as love in many societies historically and still today, but through political activism and moral progress, uh, at least in the West, there's a widespread recognition and, under and understanding that same-sex love counts as and is a coherent concept um, that's con consistent with the core notion of love. And then increasingly, we'll be in a position to intervene directly at the level of the brain. And we can also affect love in that way and possibly even bring about uh, something that is phenomenologically identical to what you would experience um, without the, the use of a, a bi biological intervention. So um, just as an example, um, I mentioned selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. I don't think I described them like that, but um, antidepressant medication is one of the main ones, is, is a drug that acts on the serotonin system. And there's, there's a lot of research suggesting that for some people, a, a well-known side effect is that it can depress libido, which is one of those underlying subsystems of love that I, I mentioned. And so if you're in a romantic relationship and having sexual desire for your partner is at least one important, important part of what it means to, to have a certain kind of love with them that maybe distinguishes it from a, a platonic friendship, well, a drug that blocks your libido could, in some sense, change something pretty critical about the nature of the love between you and your partner. Um, there are also drugs that are meant to boost libido. So one that's been marketed recently is called Adie or Flibanserin. It's a libido boosting drug for women. It, it works on serotonin and dopamine. It's controversial whether it actually works as a libido booster, but in principle, it's possible to, um, to boost libido and to, to lower libido. Uh, to go back to serotonin, one reason why it's used is it blunts or blocks your feelings uh, of chronic maladaptive sadness. That's the point of the drug. But a side effect for many people is that it can also blunt their ability to care about their partner's feelings. And if you think about one of the normative definitions of love, so if you look at the philosophy literature, uh, what, what necessary and sufficient conditions are built into some philosophers' definitions of love, well, caring about the well-being of your partner and treating that as, a, as an end in itself is often one of the non-negotiable core ingredients of love. So again, if you take a drug that inhibits your ability to even care about your partner's feelings, you can see how that could influence love in a neurochemical way pretty straightforwardly. Uh, also having effects on, on the psychological subjective experience uh, in just the way I've described. There are also drugs that can promote your ability to take an interest in your partner's feelings. Uh, the empathogen MDMA, which is the key ingredient in ecstasy, the, the party drug, 
Um, that was used in the 1980s as an adjunct to couples counseling precisely because in that therapeutic setting it could help couples take each other's perspective and be more open to hearing each other out and uh, feeling motivated to care about each other's feelings which can be positive for for love if that plays out in the right way so I don't know that's maybe what I'll say about some of the biological and psychosocial and historical ways of thinking about what love is but love just is a multidimensional phenomenon. You can think of it as a cluster of biological factors that are experienced subjectively within a certain socio-historical context, or you can think of it as a psychosocial phenomenon that's underwritten by and constrained by certain biological factors, but it's not one or the other of those things. It's, it's, it just is this multidimensional phenomenon, and so the more that we learn about what's going on neurochemically, the more uh, capacity we'll have to intervene in the neurochemistry of love with drugs, and, uh, and have ramifications at all of those other levels, including the subjective psychological levels and also potentially the, the social meanings that are attributed to love. So I hope that's helpful in some way.